join the sociology program, they do not have an academic background in sociology. So, in the beginning, you may find it a little difficult to understand. So, I like to go slow and if you can even tell me to slow down further if you are facing a problem. So, the first priority is that you should understand. So, the course is planned for four to four and a half months in which I will complete let us say 98 percent of the syllabus. As you might have seen the previous year's question papers, they give you 28 questions out of which you have to select 19. See the breakup is there is question 1 and question 5, they are compulsory and each has 5 parts. There are 5 smaller questions within question 1 and question 5 and that is compulsory. So, you have to attempt all these 10 questions. Along with that, there are another 6 questions, each with 3 parts and out of these 6 questions, you have to attempt any 3. So, that makes it 9. That is how you have 19 questions to answer. Now, if you are covering 90 percent of the syllabus, you will get your 19 questions comfortably. So, you cannot leave out much. We will tell you about expected areas, but since they have so much of choice, 19 questions to ask, they can touch almost every area. So, you cannot leave out much of the syllabus. So, have a target of at least 90, preferably 95 percent. So, initially I will go at a slow speed so that you understand and the general pattern of lecturing would be as you would see today, I will first take up a topic from the syllabus and I want you to get hold of this kind of a book. I am not marketing for New Vishal, it could be any other publication also, but this book consists of the syllabus and the previous year's questions. What I want is that after you have attended a topic, go back home and look at all the previous year's questions on that topic and you should be able to answer every question. You should feel capable of answering every question. If you can answer all the questions that have been asked since 1984, I am sure you can ask any question that can come next year. And if you feel confident to answer all the questions, then you will not have that exam panic also. You will feel confident. Now, when I say you should feel uh, confident to answer every question, there are two things to it. One, in terms of the content, that you have the requisite content to handle this question. That is one part. There is a second part also that we will come to a little later, that how exactly to organize your ideas to address to the question. Mind you, every question is a specific query and the sociology that you know is only the raw material. That raw material has to be cooked into a recipe, into a particular dish, that means to an answer to the question. So, that raw material has to be molded. How to do that, that I shall explain to you, let us say after 10 days of lecturing, when you get a little comfortable with the subject and you get familiar. So, then we will start discussing the thought framework. This is what I call the thought framework in which we will see how we are going to organize our knowledge of sociology to um, suit the question. 
But as far as the content is concerned from day one, from today itself, you should feel that I have the content for answering this question. After having gone through the lecture and after having read through the basic readings which are suggested to it. My claim, particularly with regard to thinkers, thinkers is an important area in sociology that is actually the backbone of sociology. So, my claim is that after we are done with the lectures and you have done the limited reading that I am going to suggest to you, you should be able to answer every question. If there is any question you think you cannot answer, get back to me. Next day, that becomes your doubt. So, I want you to be vigilant and actively participate. Then I will be able to give my best. Because if you are passive and you just keep listening to the lectures as people habitually listen to a discourse on Ramayana and listening to it only you feel you will you are benefited, then you will not be able to do well. So, you have to be active, you have to be vigilant. How to be vigilant? Every topic, you look at the previous year's questions. You are here not to listen to sociology, but to be a good examinee. You have to cross 300 score and that kind of score is absolutely feasible, practically possible to score in one and a half year. You have one and a half year to go or less than one and a half year to go for the mains next year. The time is enough as long as you are comfortable with grammatically correct simple English. Because that part we are not going to talk about in the sociology class. To make you understand sociology is my responsibility. I will see to it that you understand. And But for that, you have to play this active role. So, constantly keep looking at what is the challenge you are going to face. The previous year's questions are the challenge. They are a reflection of what is it you are going to face. You should be able to answer all of them. So, get hold of this booklet. It has the list of all the previous year's questions till the year 22. 23 is what is going to happen this year, main. So, till the main examination of 22, it has all the questions. And they have been classified topic wise. Though sometimes his classification is wrong, that we will modify. So, look at all the previous year's questions and make sure that you feel that you have the content to write the answer. Then as I said, after a week or 10 days, I will tell you how to mold it to write the answer. And second thing is about the readings. We have to sort of balance the readings. You should not read too much. It is absolutely useless to go on reading without understanding. But we should read enough that you can handle all questions and write your answers well. That much of reading also has to be done. Since there is time on our side that we are starting in June and the main would be sometime September or October of 24. So, I think you can show a little indulgence in reading. I think that will help. That will improve the quality of your answers. So, I will tell you what to read for paper 1 and for paper 2 that you can note down. I will tell you topic wise. <laughs> Since right now you are not carrying the syllabus with you, so I will mention the topic number. But get hold of the syllabus as early as you can. So, we begin with paper 1. 
Another thing I may tell you before I come to readings that the syllabus we will not follow exactly the sequence that is given in the syllabus while we are discussing topics in the class. There is a reason for it because there are some topics though they are mentioned right in the beginning but to understand that you need familiarity with the subject. So such topics I will take up later on. Though in the syllabus they are mentioned very early, in the beginning itself. So, you have paper 1, topic 1, sociology the discipline. Sociology the discipline. In this there are three parts. The first part is modernity and social change in Europe and emergence of sociology. This topic I am going to start with today. Then there are two other parts. One is relation of sociology with other sciences. And the second is sociology and common sense. So this relationship of sociology with other sciences, we shall take up little later. Because it calls for overall understanding of sociology. When I make a comment on nature of sociology, when you are not at all exposed to sociology, so you will just write it down like a scenographer and memorize it. You will not understand. That's why I am not taking up that immediately. And the same thing applies to the other topic, sociology and common sense, which is very, very simple topic, but still, uh, you know, it demands your awareness about sociology as a discipline. So this we'll take up later. So I'll start today with the emergence of sociology, the first topic. And then tomorrow I shall move on to the second topic that is sociology as a science. Even in this sociology as a science, two subtopics like major theoretical strands of research methodology. This calls for an awareness with different approaches in sociology. This part I will not take immediately. This part I will take after some time. Once you are becoming familiar with different research, different theoretical perspectives, that means through thinkers, after doing thinkers, I will come back to this. So, I will take up sociology as a science, positivism and its critique, and fact value and objectivity. These are the subtopics which I will take up from tomorrow onwards. Then, third topic is research methodology and analysis. This topic also I will take up later. After doing those theoretical strands in research methodology, then I will take up research methodology. This is how I am going to proceed. So, after completing sociology as a science and positivism, I will move on to thinkers. And mind you, thinkers are the backbone of the first paper. If you have thoroughly understood thinkers, 60% of first paper is in your control. Then you can handle questions for 60% for of the first paper area. So, thinkers part, I will show a lot of indulgence. I will go slow and though it is mentioned as one topic, topic four, sociological thinkers, I would spend about 20 lectures on it. Each thinker I will do in detail 
so that you can handle every possible questions that has appeared in UPSC exam since 1984 because this booklet has previous year's question papers starting from 1984. So you should be able to handle every question on thinkers. Once you have that capability and you have to constantly check it up. That's why I said by being vigilant, every lecture of mine, you go back home and look at previous year's questions, whether the job has been properly done or not. And if there is something you still cannot handle, that becomes your doubt the next day. Now, after that, it is routine syllabus. We'll follow as per the sequence of the syllabus that is mentioned. Now, coming to the readings. Topic 1 Modernity and social change in Europe and emergence of sociology. For that, primarily rely on class lecture and support it with the study material which the institute is going to provide to you. There would be a chapter on this emergence of sociology. Now, depending upon your, what should I say, motivation and commitment, there is something more that you may read which will help. That is, there is a book called Sociology, a guide to problem and literature by T. E. B. Bottomore. Sociology, a guide to problems and literature by T. B. Bottomore. I am not very sure, but I think. I'll check up and let you know by tomorrow. There is a PDF with the institute for the chapter that I want you to read from this book. They'll give you the PDF. As far as I recall, it is there. So, with that, read that at least three times. Now, why do I want you to read that? And why did I make it conditional to your motivation level? It is very directly related to your chances of scoring 300 plus. That, it will create so many doubts in your mind. When you read that chapter, Study of Society, that is the title of the chapter. When you read that chapter, it will create a lot of doubts. I want you to ask questions on those doubts. That's why I'm saying read it three times, that chapter, single chapter only. Read it three times and by second, first time it will go off over the head. Actually, you can look at the title of the book itself. The book says, A Guide to Problems in Literature. The book is not saying a textbook or an introduction to sociology. It is not a textbook. So, Second reading, you will start identifying things that you are not understanding. So, second or third reading, just underline those things which you don't understand or write down in a notebook things that you don't understand and bring it to the class as your doubts. That will give you total conceptual clarity about the subject. When we discuss and clarify those doubts, then your whole control over the subject will improve. So that is why I am suggesting that you go through that PDF. Then, for topic 2 and topic 3, topic 2 as I said is sociology as a science and topic 3 is research methods and analysis. For these two topics, 
there is a book called themes and perspectives in sociology बेटा एक किताब है ये हेरे लम्बोस की उसकी यहां पे दिखा सकते हो यहां पे पहले तो थी हाँ यहां दिखा दीजिए बोर्ड पे उसको पता होगा पुरुषोत्तम को सो द टाइटल ऑफ द बुक इज थीम्स एंड पर्सपेक्टिव्स इन सोशियोलॉजी एंड द ऑथर्स नेम्स आर हेरलम्बोस एच ए आर ए एल ए एम बी ओ एस हेरलम्बोस एन हॉलबोर एच ओ एल बी ओ आर एन इफ दे हैव द वीडियो ऑन दैट देल शो यू द बुक ऑल्सो ऑन द बोर्ड दैट ही इज चेकिंग अप नाउ वाई आई वॉन्ट यू टू सी द बुक दैट देर आर एक्चुअली टू बुक्स बाई हेर लम्बोज वन इज ऑरेंज कलर्ड एंड अ स्मॉल बुक that's totally outdated that book was published in 1980 and they continue with the same data so the data they have is of 1970s it's outdated so don't buy that book it that book is written by herlumbos and held h e a l d held now instead of that you should buy herlumbos and holborn this book has is in i think uh, they are the latest edition they are selling is 2008 edition so that's very recent so chapter 14th of herlumbos and holborn chapter 14 that will cover topic 2 and topic 3 and along with that class lecture and institute notes that is all you have to read then we come to topic 4 sociological thinkers in the syllabus we have six thinkers so five thinkers are major thinkers the sixth one is actually uh, has very little subject matter to be talked about now for these five thinkers class lecture plus institute study material these two together would suffice though if you have the curiosity to read more though these days generally students don't want to waste too much of time reading so there is a book by george ritzner there you can read three thinkers karl marx emil durkheim and max weber if you want to read you can read it that also 
you can see or judge for yourself whether what you have read is enough or not by looking at previous questions. See, these thinkers have been in the syllabus right from the beginning, from 1950s onwards. So, and you have the questions on them from 1984 on. If there is any question on these three thinkers which you cannot handle after listening to the class lecture and reading institute study material, then you should think of reading more. All right. Then you can either consult me, tell me this topic, where do I check up for additional reading? Either I will give you an additional lecture on that topic or I will tell you the source to look for. Now, there is this... Hmm. Huh. ये तो वो शुरू से देखा हाँ ती दीज आर द टॉपिक्स फ्रॉम हैरलंबोज एंड हॉलबोन दैट यू हैव टू रीड तो वी हैव नॉट येट कम टू सोशल स्टैटिफिकेशन सो जस्ट वेट हाँ ठीक है थैंक यू now, so for thinkers, what is very important is total conceptual clarity. So, don't read too much, but what you read, you must thoroughly understand. So, after reading the institute's study material and supplementing that to class lectures, if you still feel that there is something you have not covered, so additional reading for these three thinkers can be George Ritzer. The title of the book is Sociological Theory by George Ritzer. Then there are two other thinkers, Talcott Parsons and Robert Merton. These two thinkers are not handled properly by George Ritzer. So, for these two thinkers, you have to rely primarily on class lecture and institute study material. Then, the last thinker is Mead. Mead was a gentleman who wrote very little. In fact, he never wrote a book. He only delivered lectures in the class. And his students compiled the class lectures in the form of a book. So, the syllabus touches upon the central theme of Mead's ideas. Now, for this, Ritzer is very good. Ritzer has handled Mead very well. So, if you don't read Ritzer for other things, but do read it for Mead. And along with this, chapter 15th of Paralumbos and Holborn. Chapter 15th of Paralumbos and Holborn. That you have to read. That is all your reading for thinkers. Then we move on to Social stratification. Hmm. So now we move on to social stratification. Now Haralumbos is a thick book with very long chapters. Not everything from every chapter you have to read. Chapter 14th and 15th you have to read entirely. But for other chapters you have to read it selectively. So these are the topics. I think this sheet will be printed sheet. Yeah, uh, usko 
Purushottam Gopal Rao. So these are the topics that you to read from the chapter on social stratification. I think there is a printed sheet also available. They will give you that sheet. So, these are the topics from chapter on social stratification that you have to read. You do not have to read the entire chapter. Then, So this is topic 5 of the syllabus, stratification and mobility. Then you have topic 6 and the title of that topic is work and economic life. Now unfortunately, Harold Lombos does not touch this topic. And there is no other sociology textbook which touches this topic. But do not have to be disappointed. In my class lecture, I will be very elaborate, very slow and dictate you the whole thing. So rely only on the class lecture and you will be able to handle the yardstick. I have already told you, look at previous year's question. If you can handle all those questions, it is good enough. So, no reading for work and economic life. Then, topic 7. Ah, yeah. So, you have to give them. So, you do not have to note it down, they will give you the print sheet. So, topic 7, politics and society and there is a chapter on this in Haralambos. In fact, Haralambos is going to cover almost 60 to 70 percent of the first paper. So, you do not have to run around for reading sources. The only unfortunate thing is we do not have a Haralambos like book for second paper. That a single book which covers the entire syllabus. And Haralambos has written it also in a very simple language, very readable. So, chapter 7, Politics and Society. So that you have to cover from Haralambos. But there are some parts of topic 7, namely social movements, revolution, etc., that are not covered by Haralambos. So those things I will cover in the class. So class lecture plus Haralambos together would more than suffice. Then topic 8 is religion and society. And for that, Haralambos again plus class lecture. Then topic 9, systems of kinship.
systems of kinship. Again, Harry Lumbos and class lecture. And here, from Harry Lumbos, you will have to read two chapters. One is chapter two, sex and gender. This is about the issue of feminism and patriarchy. So that is covered in chapter two. And rest of the discussion on family, marriage, divorce, and so on. So th that is covered in chapter eight of Haralambos. And then you have <coughs> topic 10 of the first paper, that is social change in modern society. Now for this, again, Haralambos ditches us. Haralambos has not included this topic in his book. So, you will have to rely on institute notes, class lecture, and for one topic, you will also have to consult IGNU study material. IGNU, Indira Gandhi National Open University MA Sociology study material. Now, that topic, of course, I will do in full detail in the class, but for backup reading, because it is, see, after listening to the lecture and taking down point form notes, it is better if you have something, three, four pages to read on that. That gives you a sense of continuity. So, for that, there is a chapter in EGRU study material, that topic is Development and dependency. Development and dependency. So, for that, that IGNU booklet has to be consulted. In fact, in this handout that you are going to get on the last page, what all is to be read from IGNU study material that is also mentioned. Because for second paper, you will have to rely on IGNU. As I said, in the second paper, we do not have Haralambos like books. So, we will have to rely on IGNU. So, this is first paper. Now, if there is any confusion or any doubt you have, you can tell me before I move on to the second paper. No questions? All right. So, let me move on to second paper. Second paper has been divided into three parts. Part A, part B, part C. Then each part has been subdivided into units. So, part A has two units. One is perspectives in the study of Indian society. perspectives on the study of Indian society. What is meant by a perspective? The way of looking at something. So, how different sociologists have looked at while trying to understand Indian society? So, there are three perspectives they have talked about. For this reading, for this would be entirely the study material that institute will give you. Now, the second topic that is the impact of colonial rule on Indian society. 
for this class lecture. In fact, if you make sure that you do not miss the class lecture on second paper, which will be very elaborate, then it will save a lot of your time in terms of reading. So, for second topic, class lecture plus the study material of the institute and for one small topic, social reform movements in India, Brahmo Samaj, Arya Samaj, Pratna Samaj, all that. For that you read Bipin Chandra that you are anyway going to read for your general studies, modern India, Freedom Struggle by Bipin Chandra. In that you will find brief mention of these. You will also get study material on this from the institute also. And in addition to that, you can read Bipin Chandra, which you would, I am saying Bipin Chandra because you will anyway be reading Bipin Chandra for GS. Then we come to part B. There are six units in part B. So, unit one of part B that is agrarian social structure, the rural society in India. For that, IGNU material plus class lecture. Then, second is caste system. Primarily, institute study material and class lecture caste system. I will give a very exhaustive lecture on caste system covering up every dimension. So, you would not, you would be able to handle all questions and if you feel you can handle all questions, then you do not have to read anything else on that. Though, there is one book, the title of that book is Cast its 20th century avatar. Cast its 20th century avatar. In that book, there is one chapter by Panini. In fact, I am slightly digressing. There is a bookshop owner who gives Xerox versions of those selective chapters. You do not have to buy the whole book. But the selected Xeroxes, he may visit this place. You can place your order with him and he will give you Xerox copies of only those chapters which are to be read. Like in this case, you have to read Panini's chapter. Panini's chapter is very good about caste. So, and there is another chapter by Karanth, Jairam Karanth on caste, but Panini's chapter is particularly important. So, you can read that chapter plus institute study material and class lecture. Then, Unit 3 of part B, that is tribal communities in India, tribal communities in India. Institute study material and class lecture, that would suffice. Then unit 4, social classes in India, social 
इग्नू हैंडल्स दिस क्वाइट वेल एंड इवन दट पानिनीज एसे ऑल्सो हैंडल्स दिस सो क्लास लेक्चर इग्नू स्टडी मटीरियल एंड पानिनीज लेक्चर पानिनीज आर्टिकल देन यूनिट फाइव Systems of kinship in India. So, class lecture plus institute study material and IGNU. IGNU handles many aspect of this topic, though not all. Then. Unit six. This is about religion and society in India. In fact, there is only one main topic here: problems of religious minorities. So, class lecture and institute study material they would suffice. Then we come to part C. the last part of paper 2 last part of paper 2 is divided into seven units unit 1 that is visions of social change so rely on the class lecture and institute study material see the study material that the institute is going to give you it will also have a collection of handouts that means print outs taken from various sources so it will be not in a it will be in a spiral binding and on different topics there will be relevant articles that we have collected so it is from among those articles you will have to read the topic is about development planning and mixed economy in india then other topics the class lecture we will cover it in detail that is law and social change education and social change etc then unit 2 unit 2 is rural and agrarian transformation in india that means the changes in rural and agricultural society reading for this is institute study material and class lecture igno does not handle this topic then industrialization and urbanization in india here igno would be quite helpful along with class lecture and the institute study material so these three sources would cover the entire thing then politics and society so institute study material and class lecture because there are some parts some bits in this which are not covered and which even i find it difficult to cover in the class lecture for example political parties in india now there are 22 parties in nda and 23 parties in upa and some parties still outside both upa and nda now how do i cover so that in a lecture 
you to talk about ideology you to talk about support base you to talk about uh, the you know um, uh, the areas of influence of a party and so on so forth so for so many parties how does one handle it so i don't cover it that's why i said i'll cover 98% of the syllabus so there are some bits like this which are a little problematic and that can be left out without any hassle other parts here we will cover then there is also a topic called citizenship in india so you have the citizen ca debate and controversy chain bag and all that so that part we will cover but political parties i'll not cover then social movements in india social movements in india for this there is a very good igloo booklet the code of that booklet is mps 003 MPS zero zero three. This booklet is actually a part of their political science course and not sociology course. Ignores political science course. All the movements are covered in that single booklet. So class lecture and that MPS zero zero three. That is the booklet code. Then. you have unit 6 population dynamics for this there is a book called population studies by bhende and kanitkar bhende and kanitkar and the relevant areas of this book you can have the in the photo stated form you need not read the entire book though the book is published in india cheap enough and if you do want to read it it's simple book so some chapters can be read which are not mentioned in the syllabus but from that sometimes a question can be asked so that i'll make optional for you that when you get hold of the book you may decide right now it's too early this is almost the last topic of the syllabus so later on you can decide in particularly after i have covered this topic in the class then you can quickly browse through the relevant chapters from that book and then you have the unit 7 that's called challenges of social transformation that means the problems that we are going to fa we are facing in the process of social change in fact the entire part 3 is on social change in india so for that institute study material and class lecture so this is about your reading this is about topic specific reading now i want you to read a few books on second paper slowly which are not topic specific but which i think will help you a lot in writing in improving the quality of your answers in the second one book is society in india by david mandelbaum see this book is a background reading presuming that most of you how many of you studied sociology in the college all right okay 
there is a small mercy this time there are some people otherwise there are it's very rare to have somebody with the sociology background the majority still is without sociology background so this book society in india is a simple book it gives you the background of traditional indian society so you may buy it and slowly keep reading it over a period of 20 days or so let it sink in your mind so that you have a vivid image in your mind of how indian society that will be help it does not directly address many things in the syllabus it does talk about caste but what it talks about caste is quite old it talks about the way caste was in 1950s and 60s but it does tell you the traditional indian society because the general thrust of second paper is how traditional society is changing into modern society that is the basic perspective of paper 2 then there is another book changing india did i tell you the author's name of the first book david mandelbaum the second one is changing india by robert stern s t e r n robert stern this is a small book so read this also from cover to cover and i think at least the second book and the third one which i am going to tell you they will improve your essay quality also if the essay is on indian society you to write an essay paper so and it will also improve your gs social issues in gs the third book is by amartya sen social development and participation that's also very simple to read there is one defect in both changing india and social development that the data they are using is 2001 census so you have to update it of course the government has not given us 21 census data So everybody is relying on 2011 census data, but these books talk about 2001 census. They have not updated. That remains the lacuna. The you know. Otherwise, these are very sensibly written books, which will give help in developing a very matured understanding about Indian society. and since you do have time and i presume you are really serious about 300 plus so then you can read these two books read them slowly over a period of 2 3 months and you will get ideas which you can include in your own notes another thing that you have to do is you have to prepare your own notes combining the class lecture and the readings after the topic is done maybe after say 10 or 15 days later i'll tell you how to make notes so you to start making your notes only then sociology would stay in your mind if the whole process information is processed through your mind and written in brief point form i'll give you samples of notes making also so on those lines you have to make notes so only if you make notes then you will be able to revise then you will be able to write tests finally test writing is a very important part of your preparation sometime in december january we will call you for test writing after you have gone through the whole process and you prepared your notes then you should come and write tests because time management word management and how to mold that information according to the demand of the question all that you will learn by practically doing it 
so test writing is only possible if you have prepared notes so that you can quickly revise the whole syllabus and come and write a 3 hours test so this is about the readings if there is any question you can tell me otherwise let's start with the topic do you have any question Hmm. No questions? All right. Now, I'm starting with the first topic in the syllabus. Modernity and social change in Europe and emergence of sociology. What does this topic mean? He is asking us that what were the conditions and circumstances which gave birth to sociology? Sociology developed only in Western Europe. Only at a particular time. So, what led to growth of sociology as a discipline? Emergence of sociology as a discipline. So, he says those circumstances were the rise of modernity and social change it brought about. So, sociology is a product of those circumstances. Clear. That's why, since there was no modernity, there was no sociology in India. You might say that's not true. We had Kautilya and Arth Shastra. So we will look at it systematically and answer this question also. First, I'll start with the question: what is sociology? We are going to talk about emergence of sociology. So, what exactly is the essential nature of sociology? Sociology is a systematic attempt to understand the functioning and the changes in society. How society functions and exists and how it changes. These are the basic questions it tries to answer and it does that systematically. What is systematic? Systematic means sociology uses a method. That is what is the issue uh, which I will be talking about a little later that sociology and common sense. In fact, sociology is not the only one Sociologists are not the only people who try to understand society. All of us do. All of us try to make sense around the, the world around us. But that's common sense. We don't use the proper method. Sociology does it in a methodical way. Particularly combining reason and research. Now, there are scholarly attempts to understand society right since ancient times. There was Plato and Aristotle in Greece. There was Kautilya in India. There was Ibn Khaldun in Arabia. They did try to 
use reason also and try to understand society wrote a treatise on society but we don't call them sociology at best we call it the prehistory of sociology sociology is less than 200 years old and it is a european baby it was born in europe particularly western europe if i say 200 years it means around 18th and 19th century end of 18th century and 19th century that is the time sociology started emerging why did we need sociology at that time when we could do without it all along why did we need sociology that this was the time europe underwent profound changes far reaching changes very drastic change and these changes created a paradoxical situation a paradoxical situation with the coexistence of hope and despair that at the same time we felt something very nice is happening a better future we are heading for a desirable and a better future at the same time we felt demoralized depressed and miserable that lot bad is happening so simultaneously there existed hope and despair this was the paradox there were great achievements and dismal failures happening at the same time it was this kind of situation that gave birth to sociology now these changes particularly the changes that have been described as signs of hope changes that are considered desirable they have been labeled as modernity these changes are called modernity so modernity represents a very hopeful picture of future so that picture did emerge now what does it mean if we go by the views of one of the founders of sociology max weber he has tried to define what is modernity so he has identified four parameters four dimensions an advance with respect to those four dimensions is what is called modern in fact almost every sociology every scholar whom we call a sociologist of 19th century and early 20th century were grappling with modernity idea of modernity only talking about different aspects of modernity only the entire sociology at that time revolved around modernity so what are those four dimensions which have been considered as the fundamental characteristics of modernity one advance towards greater efficiency efficiency when things become more and more efficient for example a car is more efficient than bullock cart 
as far as the speed is concerned. It may be less efficient as far as pollution is concerned, but otherwise as far as the comfort and speed is concerned, it is more efficient. Apollo hospital is a more efficient way of treating the illness than a village Hakim. So, we are advancing towards efficiency. Then, greater calculability. Things become more calculable, measurable, quantifiable. If I give you an example of health, you go to a doctor to have your health checked up, he will recommend so many tests and finally your health would be a number of numerical data. So much of RBC count, so much of blood sugar, so much of this, so much of that, all calculable parameters. A more uh, universal example, money is a calculable index of success. You say Mukesh Ambani is more successful because he has in measurable terms so much of money. So, it is a calculable parameter. So, every aspect of life becomes calculable. When we are advancing towards modernity, we make things more and more calculable, quantifiable. Third, more predictable, advance towards predictability. Things become more and more predictable. You can predict the place where the Spacecraft is going to land on the moon even before you have fired the rocket. You can anticipate and predict the future outcomes. So, your ability for predictability increases. And fourthly, greater control, which is the net outcome of the first three. The net result is your ability to control increases. So, when man advances in this direction, in terms of these four parameters, that things become more efficient, more calculable, more predictable, and more controllable. That is what is modernization or modernity. This is a general definition of modernity. Now, but what actually happened? where all these characteristics were present in Europe. Because we are saying social modernity emerged first in Europe. Europe is the only place where modernity developed. So what actually happened? Which has come to be described as modernity. And today that is accepted as a universal modern of modernity. People like Gandhi disagreed, but the Gandhian ideas have never been taken seriously. You know, people tend to call Gandhi the father of the nation. I personally think he should be called the grandfather of the nation. You know, father is obeyed. Grandfather is respected but never taken seriously because he is considered outdated. So, Gandhian alternative has never been put into practice. So, the only model of modernity that we have is what happened in Europe. So, what actually happened in Europe? Feudal agrarian society with a subsistence economy, I repeat, feudal agrarian society with a subsistence economy started changing towards 
capitalist industrial society with a market economy. This is what actually happened. I repeat, feudal agrarian society with a subsistence economy started changing in the direction of capitalist industrial society with market economy. Now, what does it mean? I'll explain the characteristics. Though, when you write an answer, you don't have to teach the examiner, so therefore you don't have to describe these characteristics in detail. But for your understanding, since you are not from a sociology background, I'll explain the meaning of feudal agrarian society with a subsistence economy changing into capitalist industrial society with a market economy. See, in Europe, in the medieval period, the Middle Ages, there developed a social, economic and political organization, that means entire organization of society, which has been called feudalism. It was not only in Europe that feudalism developed, feudalism also developed in Japan, in China and also in India, though there were differences of feudalism in different countries. So, European society in the Middle Ages was a feudal society. What does it mean? The word feudal is taken from the Latin word feudalis, which in English is called fief. Yes, please. Hello. ये तो काम नहीं कर रहा भाई हाँ पेन ओके ओके हाँ इन लैटिन दिस वर्ड फीफ इज कॉल्ड Feudalist. So from that came the word feudal. What is? It is a system which developed in the Middle Ages, started emerging after fifth century BC AD. Now, as the empires, early ancient empires, broke down. The noble warriors noble. So the warriors were called nobles, and they were <laughs> the leaders of the military organization. They captured, carved out territories for themselves. When the central authority of the empire was collapsing, this is what happened in India also. When you know the Mauryan Empire or the Guptan Empire, when they broke down, so so many small units emerged, principalities, kingdoms, and all that. So what happened in Europe? These noble warriors they carved out territories for themselves. Suppose this is his. Territory he has carved out. He claimed ownership of that land. The entire territory was owned by the noble warrior. Now this was too big a land, so he cannot work on it. He divided it into small pieces and gave it to his followers, who were the tenants. That they had a right to control that land, but they did not own it. The land, in theory, belonged to the noble. So they were called vassal.
Now, if I give you something, I will expect something in return. So, what they expected was a share of the produce and loyalty, military loyalty that they would offer military service to the noble whenever called upon. Now, there were so many nobles. The noble who was the most powerful among all the nobles, he became the king. And at that time, king was a very weak fellow. If you have been reading Mm, you know, constitutions of different so countries or about constitution of India in general studies, you must have come across the term residuary powers. So, the king had only residuary powers. In the all internal matters, noble had autonomy. Only in residuary matters, the king had authority. So, king was a weak fellow. It was a decentralized system. So, it was an economic system, military system, political system and also a social system. Economically, this was the way agriculture was carried out. It was an agrarian society because land based. Now, what the Vesal did was, he hired peasants who were called serfs to work on that land. Vasal was a Kota noble, a tenant of the original one. And he owed him certain uh, services. And then he got that land worked by serf. Serfs were those peasants who carried out agricultural activity. And along with that, there were artisans who lived in a village. This is how society was organized. King at the top, and then nobles, then vassals, serfs, and artisans. Of course, it was ne it never a perfectly designed system. So, some people over a period of time became freeholders also. They hold the land all for themselves and were not subject to the authority of any noble. Now, then it was a rigidly stratified society. That means it was divided into different layers and the membership of these layers was determined by birth. All right. So, son of a noble would automatically be the noble, son of a serf would automatically be the serf, like that. So, it was a fixed rigidly, just like caste system was there in India 100 years ago. And economically, it was a subsistence economy. <clears throat> that means the whole production was carried out for local consumption. Very little trade. According to one economist, he has in a book mentioned that in early 15th century in France, all the goods that were imported in a year's time from outside would not be enough to fill a modern goods train today. So little was the trade. Everything was produced locally and consumed locally. That's how it was a subsistence economy. So it was now, later on, there was one change also that happened in the, that when some trade started developing towards, because the systems do not remain perfect according to the book view in reality. Things keep changing. The later part of feudalism was characterized by decline of nobles and increasing power of the king. The king got control of gunpowder. And with the gunpowder, he had superiority in the warfare. And so he became more powerful than or suppressed the nobles. And therefore, 
there developed the idea of strong monarchy and there was an ideological justification of that through what is called divine right theory that king has been ordained by god to rule and therefore he must be obeyed king can no do no wrong so power of the king increased as i said it increased because of trade on one hand giving more income to the king custom duties were collected by the king and he became richer and secondly he had control over gunpowder so he became more powerful militarily and so this idea of divine right theory developed so that is how the feudal system existed in europe it was a rural agrarian stagnant society which was rigidly stratified have you understood anything you have not understood when i define modernity i said feudal agrarian society with a subsistence economy change into more uh, capitalist industrial society with market economy so first part i have explained what is feudal society with an subsistence economy have you understood this okay now this explanation you don't have to write in your answer this is for your understanding so that you have rather than just mechanically cramming that it was feudal society was there now this society changed into capitalist society capitalist society is fundamentally different from feudal society capitalist society looks at economic activity as a source of generating continuous profits unlimited desires adani wants even more now in spite of having him so much of wealth he says no there should be still more it's never enough capitalism's ideology is unlimited desires and therefore continuous generation of profit subsistence economy is limited desires so capitalist system developed and that was based on more advanced technology the production was <clears throat> carried out through advanced technology why do i call it advanced technology because that technology was able to use hydrocarbon energy petrol initially coal and then petrol and with that hydrocarbon energy mechanized production could be carried out that's why we call it industrial and the production was for the market production was not to satisfy only local needs nike does not make shoes only for the people who work in nike and if they all have got shoes they'll stop the factory it doesn't happen like that they want to sell it everywhere on the earth and if on the mars also there are people with legs they'll start exporting it to mars because it is never ending they want to produce more and more it's for the market the whole idea is to generate a surplus so the feudal society changed into capitalist industrial society with a market economy this is what had happened now this was a very drastic change to further describe this change we can split it into different dimensions that how different aspect of society change so there are since the change is drastic so often the sociologists and even historians they refer to these changes as revolutions revolution means far reaching change a thorough going change now so there was economic revolution 
there was political revolution and there was an intellectual revolution. See, these are different aspects of social life. All are connected. So if one part changes, other part also changes. It is for convenience sake we have divided into three categories and so that we can talk about each one of them. Now economic revolutions. <clears throat> that it is around 13th century we had Marco Polo discovering the land route to the east, the silk route as it was called, to China and other eastern societies. China was very advanced at that time, technologically. In fact, the mother of all Western technology is China. It came from China to West. So, once the land route was discovered, trade started developing. And that led to the diffusion of Chinese technology. For example, mariner's compass, gunpowder, printing press, and so on. Now, mariner's compass gave a massive boost to seafaring. Seafaring, that means traveling in the oceans, shipping. Now, you could identify the direction of your movement. So, that facilitated the journey through the sea. So, seafaring followed. And that led to, you know, discovery of Americas. Later on also, the sea route to India and East. All this culminated into trade. Lot of trade started developing. Now, Trade was the means of generating profits. So, we call it mercantilist phase of capitalism. This was the first phase of capitalism. Capitalism's purpose is to generate surplus, to make profits. So, first the profit was being made through trade. Goods procured from China, India and even uh, Southeast Asia, spices and other things. And sold in Europe. India and China were technologically far advanced than Europe at that time. So, the mercantilist phase. East India Company is an example of that. They came to India for trading to buy go finished goods from here and to sell them in Europe. That Merchant of Venice, the play by Shakespeare talks about this kind of process happening in Europe. Now, through this people accumulated wealth. But this was a hard earned wealth because imagine somebody in those primitive ships traveling all the way 6000 miles to India, buying spices from Kerala and then going back to Europe. How risky was the journey? So it was a hard earned money. They would not like that money to lie waste. So they started investing it further. And few opportunities existed. The only option initially available was land. So they started investing it in land and using it to generate further profits. So scientific farming, not scientific in terms of green revolution because that much of advance did not exist, scientific by those standards, scientific farming or sheep rearing because uh, Europe needs woolen garments, so sheep rearing became a very profitable business. So that is how they transformed the very character of the village. The village society, which earlier consisted of serf and artisans, 
Now all these shops were evicted, and they will enclose a large area for sheep rearing or for scientific cultivation. In history, this has been called enclosure movement because they went about enclosing farms, huge estates, and evicting the serfs and artisans. Now, so this has been called agricultural revolution. Or, in other words, this was capitalistic transformation of agriculture. First, there was mercantilism, capitalistic trade, then it was followed by capitalistic transformation of agriculture. Now, as I said, the serfs and artisans were being evicted, so a lot of population was being <coughs> shifted away from <coughs> rural areas. And in the meanwhile, as trade was growing, the organization of trade in urban areas was through guild. Guild was the you know organization through which trade and production was regulated. So this guild organization broke down because guild would put a limit on how many articles you can produce. It was like the license permit quota raj in India. The government will say the, you can't produce more than this, where they'll issue a license and you to produce according to that. So that restriction slowly broke down. Free trade and competitive business developed. Now, generation of surplus that means wealth from trade and agriculture. Along with this, there was growth of science and new technology became available. So, the merchants started organizing production in the factories for which cheap labor was available from these evicted serpent artisans. New technology provided the machinery and the wealth generated from trade and agriculture that provided the capital and that is how factory system of production started developing. That is how the process was being, you know, unfolding towards capitalist industrial society. Now, in feudalism, labor was tied to the employer and the land and the bonds were hereditary. So when all these serfs were evicted, all those hereditary bonds broke down. In hereditary bonds, there was a lot of security that my lord will take care of me at the time of drought or famine. Now, all these bonds broke down and poor people were totally at the mercy of the god. So, contractual relations developed cash nexus and wage labor relations develop. There was no cash nexus here. The serfs, they were given a small piece of land for their personal upkeep. And in return for that, they had to work for the rest of the land of the vassal or the lord, noble. Now, instead of that, wage labor, cash paid in cash. So, the entire organization of production changed. New technology is advanced. And as a result of this, new classes also emerge. The bourgeoisie and the proletariat. These are the terms taken from French language, but have been popularized. Bourgeoisie. Proletariat. Bourgeoisie means the capitalists, the wealthy merchants and industrialists. Proletariat means workers who were devoid of any wealth, had no control over productive assets, did not own either a machine or the factory or anything, 
or land and totally dependent on wages for which they had to work and since there were so many of them so there was surplus of labor and therefore they were employed at a very low wage starvation wages i'll give you an example you know from the same uh, source that i mentioned from about economist heel bronner he, he has written in his book that in france in the early 19th century if a worker remain employed for the whole year he would get 500 francs as the wages but even a family of 3 husband wife and a single child they needed at least 900 francs to stay alive in a year so even if you are employed for the whole year you are at the starvation level so what will happen wife and children would also have to work so this was the time women and children they were also made to work and in very very inhuman conditions 18 hours a day was the routine working time without a sunday break and the wages were so low that the family just barely managed to survive so they were the proletariat so that is how society got polarized now here there was hope i said in the beginning that the situation was the one of hope and despair the hope that for the first time unprecedented wealth was generated the entire energy of the society was to directed to a generation of wealth so bourgeoisie lived in opulence like a money living in 27 storied house i don't know what does he do with 27 stories so that is opulence vulgar display of wealth so bourgeoisie lived in opulence proletariat at near starvation society got polar and along with that also there was growth of colonies and world trade and all that which further accumulated led to accumulation of wealth because so much of wealth was extracted from the colonies and transferred to the metropolitan country so this is how modernity unfolded this modernity as i said had a positive side that one growth of science and technology and therefore increase in man's control over nature unprecedented wealth opulence for some that's a positive side then there was the traumatic negative side that as i said there was urbanization because all these serfs and artisans were thrown out of their villages they moved to the city so traditional family bonds community bonds they all broke people were poor earlier also but poverty when it is shared becomes livable now they were all left to themselves to fend for their life in urban areas no community bond no family bond each husband wife and children staying together so these bonds broke down that made life extremely miserable then there was extreme poverty among the proletariat who constituted the majority now needless to say that if there is so much of difference between people economic difference rich and poor such a society can never be peaceful if there is so much of disparity it is not a very nice thing to say but it is a fact we are heading for this kind of a situation after economic reforms and liberalization disparities are growing so there is wealth for some and extreme poverty for many when such kind of disparity or inequality exists then society becomes violent 
because the poor resort to protest to feed themselves so there were class wars class means a group of people having similar economic circumstances so proletariat is one class bourgeoisie are another class so that means conflict based on economic inequality that is what is meant by class war so there were violent class wars in entire europe uprisings poor people rising in revolt and of course getting killed in the process then there was disease when people lived in abject poverty in very dismal conditions there was unhygienic living conditions see it was said that in 19th century when the parliament was held in meeting was held in london near the river thames the thames used to stink so much that they had to burn incense sticks in the parliamentary building to make it tolerable so much was the pollution in the river there was no safe drinking water available no health care available so disease crime and violent conflict that became the daily feature of the society in western europe now then there was another aspect political revolution that as the locus of economic power shifted do you understand locus means location who has economic power who is wealthy that changed with the rise of capitalism nobles were no longer the wealthy people king was no longer the most powerful person the wealth moved into the hands of bourgeoisie and in france actually the king was so miserable financially that it is started selling offices it is like ias officers are made on the basis of money they donate to the ruler all right that kind of system developed and the king in need of money therefore allotted offices to members of bourgeoisie they became powerful so when economic power changes location of economic power changes the political power also follows suit so bourgeoisie so far the political power was in the hands of the king and the nobles bourgeoisie started challenging it now king and the nobles enjoyed certain privileges they had arbitrary rights to exercise power as i said the divine right theory said king can do no wrong whatever the king says is right so it means total arbitrary power so in the mid medieval times the power had become arbitrary now bourgeoisie had become powerful initially they tolerated it they served the king because they needed protection of the king against the low nobles but once they became strong enough they started questioning the king it is like a small child treats his father as a superhuman figure and totally obeys him because he depends on the father once he is 18 years old he starts finding flaws that old man is not always right he starts questioning his authority because he acquires power so the bourgeoisie became powerful they challenged the authority of the king and the nobles idea of equality freedom individualism these ideas developed so they challenged the authority as long as they were weak they argued a weak fellow argues strong fellow slaps and snatches so when they became strong they attacked the king and the nobles politically and violently french revolution the entire nobility was beheaded the king was beheaded overthrew the entire feudal order now this 
created totally unstable society because the traditional feudal order had created a pattern of stability. They had overthrown that order. The new was not yet fully established. So there was continuous period of dislocation of various kinds of upheavals. In I'll give you an example that in France, in one single campaign, Napoleon, Napoleon led a campaign to Russia, went up to Moscow, and then the winter set in. They had no uh, winter uniform to protect them against the severe winter of Russia. Six lakh soldiers died of winter, of cold. Imagine the impact it will have in a country like France, which is, France means Haryana, Punjab put together. In such a small country, six lakh people died in one campaign. There was not a single family which had not lost at least one able-bodied young person in either a civil war or an international war. And Napoleon went about overthrowing all the divinely ordained kings. He defeated all of them. So the, the prestige of monarchy collapsed. And people themselves started rising in revolt against their monarch. 19th century has been called by historians the century of revolution. There were revolutions everywhere. In Germany, in Denmark, in Belgium, in France, and so on, except England. So, continuous upheaval, bloodshed, violence. Now, traditional wisdom and religion. Because in medieval times, all knowledge about human beings was a part of religion. There were no social sciences. So religion provided all knowledge and thinking, shaped all thinking about human beings. The religion had no answer to these problems. That conventional, traditional thinking also had no answer to these problems. So this created um, an intellectual vacuum that we need to understand what's happening. We created this world. Industrial society was a man-made world. Bible says God created man. God said, let there be light and there was light. People were saying in, the, in Europe, Newton said, let there be light and there was light. It was not God created, it was science created. Scientists were human beings. So it was a man-made world. And yet that world was totally unlivable. So violent. So the new query, search for new knowledge to understand what's happening. And therefore, the traditional ideas lost their plausibility. Religion lost its plausibility. Plausibility and sense, believability. That ideas appear sensible and believable. That's what is called plausible. So traditional ideas and religion lost its plausibility. Now, it was at this time, however, there was growth of sciences. That is the intellectual revolution. So this economic and political revolution was also accompanied with the intellectual revolution. There was the growth of sciences that according to Jonathan Turner, the scientific revolutions of 16th and 17th centuries inspired people. It was believed that <laughs> with Newtonian physics, science had reached a peak. The post-Newtonian view of science was dramatically different from previous views. 
the dualism between reason and sense is broke down. You understand dual? Huh? I'll repeat. You can note down if you want to. Jonathan Turner's view it is. He says that people derived inspiration from the scientific revolutions of 16th and 17th centuries. That it was believed that scientific revolution had reached a peak with Newtonian physics. The post-Newtonian view of science was dramatically different from previous ones. The old dualism between reason and senses broke down. See, there are two things. One, what mind thinks. Secondly, what actually happens and which is observable. The two were are traditionally thought as separate things. That dualism broke down. Because what does science do? It combines reason with research. You base your ideas by combining, by subjecting your logic to facts. Alright? You carry out observation and based on that observation, applying laws of deductive logic and inductive logic, you arrive at theories and laws. I'll discuss that in detail maybe tomorrow when I take up scientific method, the, how science operates. So, this dualism broke down. That was a great change, intellectually. That's how there was an intellectual revolution. And so people reflected on the changes. I have described the changes in the economic and political and social sphere. So the contemporaries were also reflecting on these changes, trying to understand. So they started producing new ideas. These ideas have been called enlightenment. They did not call it enlightenment. Later on, historians have referred to that period of intellectual ferment as enlightenment. It has been called enlightenment movement. So, actually they were isolated philosophers living in different parts of Europe thinking independently, but they shared many ideas in common. That's how they are clubbed together as enlightenment. Voltaire, Rousseau, Condorcet, Turgot, they were in France. Montesquieu, they were French. In fact, most of them are from France because France was the most disturbed society of that time. Adam Smith, Robertson, they were Ferguson, they were in England, Hegel in Germany, Vico in Italy. These are all the names of the various philosophers who were reflecting on these changes. And they were influenced and inspired by science. That's what I mentioned. No? Jonathan Turner says that they were inspired by science. So, these, this enlightenment represent intellectual modernity. This enlightenment thought represents intellectual modernity. How there was a modernity rationalization at the intellectual level. So, now as I said, modernity is only about capitalism. So, in simple words, they justified modern industrial capitalism. Intellectually, they said equality. So they said noble and king has no special role. We are all equal. Equality before law. They said every person should be free, individualism and liberty. So they developed the ideology of liberalism. That represented, that was represented by enlightenment movement. Then another very <laughs> important feature of enlightenment was that clearly shows that how they were supporters of capitalism. 
they described these changes as progress. It's a very profound idea. They were saying, we are heading for a better world. Now, today you are not impressed when I say they talked about progress because you have grown up listening to this fact of progress. Every journalist, every political leader, everybody says we are progressing, we are progressing. But in the 18th and 19th century, when thinking was dominated by religion, you know what does Bible say? That this world exists as it was created by God and it was created 7000 years ago. They said, no, it was Mr. and Mrs. Monkey from where it all started. And we are constantly advancing biologically as well as socially. Darwin. So, the idea of progress developed. They said, we are heading for a better world. This was the sign of hope. That is how enlightenment represented the hope. And they said, the present day problems are therefore temporary blemishes, short term problems, solvable, manageable problems. They said man has certain natural rights, right to equality, right to freedom. It is the bad system of feudalism which is destroying these rights. So these rights are being denied by a bad social order by bad legislation. All that we need to do is to destroy these institutions of feudalism and to break the laws of feudal order and create new laws based on new knowledge. New knowledge must be acquired the same way as science has acquired knowledge. That science by combining reason and research has produced knowledge with which man could control nature through engineering. Same way, if I put it in the modern language, present day language, enlightenment thinkers were saying that we can have social engineering also by combining reason and research about society. So they separated knowledge about human beings from religion. Earlier, all knowledge about human beings was religious knowledge. They said, no, they produce secular knowledge. And they said, we should build a new science where we combine reason and research and produce laws. Law of gravitation of Newton was taken as, you know, as the emblem. That in the similar way, we can have laws about human society. There are two aspects of human society that are important. One, the stability and the continuity. Second, the change. We should discover laws about both. And with the help of these laws, we should create, just like physics controls the physical environment by, with the help of knowledge of laws, same way we can control social life also with the help of new laws. So enlightenment contributed to the idea that firstly they said, I am repeating, firstly they said these problems are short term problems. They can be solved with right knowledge and right legislation. Second thing they said that new knowledge should involve combination of reason and research the way it has been done in physics and biology. Third thing they said was use that knowledge to construct a better society. Destroy the feudal order. And that is why they justified revolutions also. So that is how the intellectual revolution contributed to the rise of new science. Now there is something more. See, when change happens, there are two types of people. One kind of people admire that change and applaud it. Good. Other kind of people condemn those changes also. Like people of a generation older than me would say, as they show in Hindi movies, Ramu ki amma Kalyuga has come. It is Kalyug. When they see the changes in society, 
So the same thing was happening in Europe also. There was another current of thought. Many thinkers, they were shocked by the chaos and disorder that resulted. And they wanted to go back to the peace and harmony of the Middle Ages. So they emphasized on the need for peace and harmony. Of course, the people who were to become sociologists, they were realistic enough that we can't go back in history. But they did accept this point emphasized by the critiques of modernity. This was anti-modernity who were saying that the system has become chaotic disorder and we should go back to society with peace and harmony. They did not consider it as progress. So their emphasis of their emphasis on peace and harmony defined the goals of sociology. New science was to be created. Why? To have peace and harmony. The idea of peace and harmony came from counter enlightenment. And how the means for new science, new knowledge should come from enlightenment. Use the scientific method. The enlightenment thinker said, use the methods of science, create a new knowledge. So the means of sociology came from the enlightenment thought. The goals of sociology came from counter enlightenment. Somehow to restore peace and harmony. And that is how the onset of modernity and social changes in Europe contributed to emergence of new science that is sociology. Now, sociology developed in 19th century in Europe by late 19th and early 20th century it spread to other parts particularly America. Now, I am reading out from Martin Slatery, his comment on sociology in America. You can, if you want to note it down. He says, sociology was born in Europe, but it flourished in America. especially till 1940s when Europe was submerged beneath world war, mass employment, sorry, mass unemployment, I'm sorry, mass unemployment and the rise of fascism America continued to enjoy the fruits and freedom of capitalism. It remained the land of the free. American sociology grew up in the political environment of liberalism and individualism. So there was no need for social revolution. Rather, there was need for reform. They had no feudal order to destroy. You know, America is a land without history. That if you trace America's history, after 16th century, you have to come back to Europe. Because real Americans were Red Indians who have been almost eliminated. So there was no feudal order. There was no rigid social structure in America. And therefore, there was no conflict that developed in Europe, class wars and the structured inequality, rigid inequality. All that was not there in America. So in America, they had only problems of capitalism 
making capitalism more livable. So there were problems like child labor, juvenile delinquency, race relations, gender issues, alcoholism, labor unrest, these practical day-to-day -day problems. In fact, one thinker has made a distinction between European and American, so early American sociology. That European sociology was prophetic sociology, American sociology was priestly sociology. Prophet is a visionary who has a moral worldview and thinks of the long and the totality. Priest is a technical expert. He has no moral constraints. Whether you are a thief, smuggler or a good person, if you pay the priest, he will come and perform puja for you. So he is amoral and he is concerned with practical problems. Grah Pravesh, Naya Ghar Banaya, Grah Pravesh Karna, so I will perform this puja for you. So he is concerned with reform and practical problems. So American sociology was more priestly, while European sociology was prophetic. And in the 20th century, therefore, sociology flourished in America with the rise of capitalism, concerned with social reform. That is why, as later on you will understand, why it took so long for Marxism to be accepted in America. Marxism was concerned with revolutionary change. Because that was to destroy the society. Now, today, modernity has become global. And therefore, the problems of modernity are also global. And therefore, sociology is also global. Today, sociology is a global discipline. It is no longer confined to Europe. So, this is about the emergence of sociology. Now, if there are any question, please tell me. I have overshot the time limit, but because I had to tell you about reading list. So, <coughs> mention the name. Martin Slatery. S-L-A-T-T-E-R-Y. Martin Slatery. Have you understood? That is my question. If there is any major doubt or problem, please tell me. Hmm. Yeah, because Europe, you can say there were historical accidents, including discovery of the land route to China and importation of new technology from China, which Europeans adapted to contemporary needs. Now, why it did not happen? Because these capitalism never developed anywhere except Europe. This is a part of your sociology syllabus and as we proceed with it, I will be discussing various factors that happened only in Europe and did not happen elsewhere, which contributed to the rise of capitalism. Modernity is associated with capitalism. Modernity is a celebration of capitalism. So, there were special factors that I will discuss with you when we proceed with the course. So, you will come to understand why those factors played a role in development of modernity. Yes, please. A little louder. Dualism between fact and uh, reason. They were treated as two separate things. Reason was seen as abstract reasoning based on a priori assumptions. So, now in science, reason and facts are brought together. Reason is governed in the light of empirical data. Hmm. No other question? Now you can get hold of the book list, uh, that booklet where previous year's questions are there and go through them and identify your doubts tomorrow if there are any. Huh.
This was hoped that present knowledge is useless, religious and traditional. So we need new knowledge, which would be helpful because that new knowledge had helped in physics. It led to engineering and that led to control over nature. So there can be social engineering also, a society, a science of society which will give new knowledge, which will help us in controlling society. We'll be able to create a society of our own choice. Can we Definitely, they had power because of technology, because of capitalism, because of wealth generated. But that happened first in Europe. We'll discuss that. In I. There is a rational explanation for your question, but I cannot give you instant explanation because there are various factors responsible for it. All right, thank you.